Good day, Stella. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. And it's lovely to meet you. Yeah, you and I have not met. This is our first time talking to each other uh, virtually here in this case. Um, but I've been following you for a number of years, and I, I think I was introduced to you through some of the uh, things that Miriam Nealon had shared online, and I followed up with that and became interested. And I bought your book a while back, and uh, uh, as I just told you before we started here, I'm only about 20% through it, so I can't talk very intelligently about it, but I'm looking forward to finishing it. Um, what I would like to do is start off and introduce you to the audience and do a little background. And I have a four part series of questions that I'm going to walk you through. So let's get started with uh, where did you grow up? Oh, I grew up in um, Birkenhead in the northwest of England. So if you've ever heard the song Ferry Across the Mersey, um, well, we were the other side of the Mersey, so it was very across the Mersey from Liverpool, and we were the other side of the Mersey. So that's where I grew up. Well, I was a fan of Jerry and the Peacemakers. Way okay, there you go. So I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about, but most of the audience probably hasn't a clue. But they Maybe should. Not. So where did you go to college, and what did you study? So I went to uh, to college or university, as we say in the UK, um, and in Sheffield, which is a a city kind of in the middle of the UK and I studied psychology which I absolutely loved. That's very interesting one of my uh, good friends from back in the early 80s when I first met him Neil Rackham went to school there and, and also studied psychology he's I'm a big fan of his work. And so then I actually went to um, the City University and I did a master's in human communication which was also you know, just a huge insight and revelation into how people communicate and think. And yeah, it was great. Mm -hmm. So uh, where do you live now and uh, what do you do for a living? So I'm currently living in Belgium. So I've moved quite a long way, uh, moved to Belgium via Spain. We also lived in New Zealand for some time. Um, and what I'm currently doing for a living. So I'm co-founder and chief learning officer at a company called Stella Labs. And our mission is to, to beat the upskilling challenges that are currently out there facing many organizations, many people, and to try and make sure that people, you know, become the best people they can be. Thank you for that. So now what I'd like to do is I'd like to go from the time you got out of college to how, where, how did you get to where you are today? So can you share with us a little bit about the progression of jobs that you've had on your way to Stellar Labs? So when I was studying at uh, doing psychology, as part of what we had to do, we had to do a one week course on digital learning on computers. And I just thought this was stupid. I couldn't see the point of it. It really annoyed me. But when I was studying my master's, I got very interested in speech aids for people with learning or with speech disabilities. And we were looking at digital aids for people. So then I suddenly thought, hey, there's a real purpose to computing. I can understand that. And back in the, a long time ago, when I put my first job, there were a lot of jobs in the IT industry. So I joined a bank, which is, you know, really not my kind of forte now, but I joined a bank. I joined their new IT team um, and, and I moved into IT. I became a COBOL programmer. I did some system support and did some analysis and then quite quickly moved out of the bank. Um, and then joined another company where I was, yeah, I was a, a sort of analyst support person, um, did a lot of coding in COBOL. So I had a real, you know, I was working in IT. And then uh, one point as part of that job, I kind of got involved in some of the research that was going on around expert systems. So that kind of precursor, to, well, AI was already invented, but sort of an early AI system. Um, which was also really interesting. So I didn't want to be in learning and development because all my family were in teaching and I didn't want to do that. But as part of this job, um, actually, no, it was another job. Then we went to New Zealand for a few years. Again, I was still coding. I was still helping people you know, do their jobs better. And then um, came back to the UK, got a job as learning support and training manager. And I really didn't want to do the training manager bit. It was like, well, I don't do training. A lot of IT training is really boring. I didn't want to do that. Anyway, took on um, a colleague who was really inspirational, 
really helped me see that actually what training, good training does is really help people do their jobs better. So it's that whole kind of, you know, how can you help people be better in their careers? And I kind of fell in love with it. And from then on, moved into, into training. Mm-hmm. So, so where did I go from there? So I worked for that company for a little while. And then, and then eventually I set up on my own and became an independent trainer and did that for 20 plus years. So how long have you been uh, with Stellar Labs? So Stellar Labs, we started the business two and a half years ago. So two and a half years. <laughs> so uh, what uh, what is Stellar Labs doing with clients? Can you give us any specific examples of the kinds of things that you're doing right now? So so what we're absolutely doing right now is we are building a an upskilling accelerator platform. So we're really focused on uh, helping people put skills into the workplace so they can actually transfer their skills into the workplace. And we're effectively building a platform that kind of clones all the things we've, that I've been doing in my previous company, really making sure that people you know, enjoy the learning experience, but that they can then apply their skills. So not just knowledge, but apply their skills in the workplace. And that's what we're doing. We're building a platform that does that more automatically than we can do it currently. Mm-hmm. So it's a, a learning design assist, a learning design assistant to support people to design better learning. But wow. it's all, all also a learning, like a learning coaching digital assistant to help learners actually, you know, use some of the content that's already there, use some of the, the activities that are already there, but really make sure that they're, they're transferring what they do into the workplace. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you. So the title of my video series here is HPT videos, HPT being human performance technology, sometimes known as human performance improvement. It's been known as many, many things over the years, but it's really all about evidence-based practices, or as Miriam Nealon and Paul Kirshner might say, evidence-informed practices, all about performance improvement, of which knowledge and skills is but one element in that whole uh, set of enablers that enables performance. But when did you first come across any aspects of that evidence-informed, evidence-based practices within the learning uh, field? So in the learning field, I guess it was uh, when I came across Dave Myers. So I got interested in accelerated learning. um, And I really liked what he was doing because I think it felt like it was... um, it seemed much more practical and the kind of the, the very content heavy training or the very just classroom focused where a, somebody just talked at you. It was much more practical. It was much more engaging. And it was the learner doing the doing. And really what that did for me was all the psychology I'd learned at university. It was really suddenly that all made sense. You know, it kind of that's what we studied at university, that your brain changes. And in order to change your brain, you need to do something. So for me, it was that kind of early-ish accelerated learning stuff. So there was Dave Myers, there was um, Colin Rose, who was also quite an influential, um, you know, I read a lot of stuff by him. Paul Matthews here in the, or there in the UK, um, he was very good in terms of really thinking about how do people actually learn in the flow of their work, in their workplace, you know, in their real jobs. So I think they were some of my early influences. Well, good. Thank you for that. Uh, in a few minutes here, we'll get to some of your more recent influences. And I thank you for giving me that uh, that list of people that, that have been influential to you, uh, because I would like to point our audience to resources that that, of, that my target, uh, my guests here feel w- were impactful to them and their practices. Um, were there anything besides those people that you just mentioned, some books or articles that you might point people to from when you or that were influential to you in your early uh, uh, journey in the learning space? Yeah. So, I mean, both Dave Myers, Colin Rose and Paul Matthews have all written books, so they're really good. Um, Richard Meyer wrote a book on multimedia learning. I also think that was really well evidence-based and informed. And whilst it's not entirely learning but it was very influential on me was Robert Cialdini's um, influence science and practice because 
it's not learning exactly but you know when you're teaching people when you're working with people you have to influence them and so there are a lot of things in that that really made me think okay this is really important in terms of how do we persuade people to want to learn how do we persuade them to keep coming on that journey um, how do we persuade them to stick with the learning and how do we get them to take action as well you know there's something around the action the action oriented bit there that's really really vital i think so that was that was a, a book that you know i still tell people you must read this book <laughs> excellent thank you so much if you were to give us a, a again we're, i'm trying to provide examples to our audience here but if you were to give us a 30 second elevator speech or perhaps it's a lift speech over on your side of the pond uh, what would you say if you were at a garden party and somebody asked you stella what do you do what's your answer to them so i like to say that one of the things i do is i mess with people's brains so that they can do things better than they could do them before. Excellent. That's good. <laughs> of course, if the person is interested, they'll probe further to find that's out. What, yeah, I always think give them something that sort of, you know, makes them makes them curious. You know, how can I get people curious? Because I think curiosity is such an enabler of learning. If we're curious, we tend to do things for ourselves. And OK, I think we really need some guidance and support, particularly if we're new. But curiosity is, is the key to a lot of learning, I think. Thank you. Uh, as a lifelong learner, can you share with us any current focus or your next focus for your own learning? Absolutely. So where I am currently focused, I am really, really interested in the stuff that... Um, now, I've got, completely forgotten. No, I've got a book here. Uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett is doing on... Um, the predictive brain. So she's done a book on how emotions work and it's just really, really fascinating. And it really throws into, you know, in terms of evidence base, it, it disrupts a lot of what we've you know, thought for many, many years. But at the same time, when you, when I read it, she really validated some things that, you know, you used to have ideas floating around up here and you think, yeah, but maybe there's nothing there. Maybe that's just me. And actually she really validated some of that. So she, I'm really interested in what she's doing. Um, I'm also really interested in some of the kind of behavioral nudging stuff we can do and how we can do that more in, in learning. Um, I think, you know, good trainers do it quite naturally, but how can we how can we build the technology that also helps us do that? So some of that sort of, um, yeah, the, the tech, the behavioral tech stuff, how can we use the tech to help us support people's behavioral changes? So those are the, some of the things I'm really interested in. Um, and then also... I was reflecting on you know early influences and when I did my degree fortunately I went to university where they actually really looked at artificial intelligence as part of the psychology degree and Margaret Bowden was a really inspirational woman in AI way back in the 1980s so I'm really interested in, in AI now you know that's becoming much more common in terms of, of uh, learning isn't it so you know following people like um, Donald uh, Clark to see what he's saying about that Mm hmm. Thank you. Are you doing any uh, writing now? I know you've got your book out, but uh, and do you have that book to hold up to our audience? I do, as instructed. I, I, I only have the Kindle version, so I, I can't hold it up and you can't see it. Thank you for that. So neuroscience for learning and development. So um, are you doing any additional writing besides that book? So I do a lot of writing for you know the company for writing for clients and blogs and blog posts and things and I've, I've actually got to do the third edition of that book ah. so actually one of my tasks this summer is to really review some of the work that I've picked up in the last I think it's three years since I wrote the last edition and update it so, because that's one of the challenges of you know writing an evidence-based book if you read something new you have to do some more so you know I've got Miriam's book here um, you know I've got a lot of a lot of other books that are going to influence not change the book entirely because it's just an addition but but I also really want to book, write a book on and I've written some ebooks and things on how we can help learners learn so how do you learn as a learner what are some of those top tips you can pick up as a learner so mm -hmm. that would be another thing I really want to to work on oh excellent um so I wanted to shift gears here to our terminology the language that we use in the field and this has been an age-old issue um so I, my question is, is there a performance improvement or a learning term or phrase that you would like to define for us 
because perhaps you feel it's being misused or misconstrued and you'd like to put your own spin on it? So there's an interesting one and it's a discussion I quite often have with Miriam that she sort of says neuroscience in learning, you know, got no, got no impact. Um, I believe neuroscience in learning does have an impact. I think if we're going to, you know, we are genuinely messing with people's brains, so we should know something about it. And for me, I think it's about defining what neuroscience means. So for me, it's quite a broad definition of, you know, all the things that are relevant to how do we as people, not just our brains, but our bodies, what's the science behind how our brains and bodies learn, but then also bringing in, you know, some of the, the technological science and some of the artificial intelligence and, and bringing those together to think about how can we best impact brains and bodies to learn. Yes, thank you. Um, so it, the next question is um, about more of the your current influence. You've mentioned a couple of people, Miriam's book uh, with Paul Kirshner, you mentioned Donald Clark. Uh, who else would you point our audience to uh, the, the, some of the people who have maybe had a more recent impact on you that you've not already mentioned? So I think Kathy Moore is really important. I really love the way she she's always talking about getting people doing the doing. So it's not about what they know, it's about what they can do. So I think she's really important. Um, it's really funny, I, I was reflecting on, you know, who, I, who were my influences early on and who are they now? And actually they really shifted to being a lot more women now. So Ina Weinbauer Heidel, uh, over in Germany, she's really, really good on learning transfer and the 12 leaders of learning transfer. I think she's fantastic. Um, Julie Dirksen, again, very evidence-based. Um, Amy Bram, who isn't specifically around learning, but she is around kind of performance at work. And um, so she's really interesting in terms of what she talks about in terms of you know, the brain and, and what we do there. So, and, and then, yeah, Miriam again. So I think those are my key influences. And um, Nir Eel, I think that's his name. So he's been, uh, he wrote that book, uh, Hooked. You know, how do we get hooked to tech um, in a good way, in a good way. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I think they're my, they're my, those are my key reads at the moment. Those are the ones I keep picking up and reading again and again. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. And, and thank you for participating with me in this video interview. My final question to you is, do you have any parts, uh, parting words of wisdom or guidance for people new to the field, um, uh, especially to all things, anything related to performance improvement? What would your guidance be for those people? I think keep challenging and asking. Ask people, you know, if they're, if they're telling you something, ask them, well, what's the evidence behind this? Not that you need to become a scientist yourself if you're not a scientist, but just checking in, not just taking things for, you know, face value or for granted, asking a bit, you know, a few more questions, digging deeper. What's the, you know, what's the impact of this theory or this idea? And, you know, is the real evidence behind it? Is there some science behind it? Or is it just, you know, like, I'm going to mention it because I feel the need to, but, you know, MBTI, there's, there's no evidence for that. So we really shouldn't be using it. Just because something's old doesn't make it wrong. And just because something's new doesn't make it right. But what's the evidence behind? And just keep asking that question because the evidence changes as we learn more stuff, the evidence changes. So, yeah, don't accept things on face value. Challenge and question. Be curious. Very good advice. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, again, thanks for doing this interview with me. And I, I wish you a good day. Thank you very much. It was lovely to meet you. Nice to meet you.